paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. So glad to have this opportunity on this glorious Lord's Day to spend and help start your day. Got the, the uh, spoken word coming up in just a second. Plus, we'll inspire and encourage as well as uh, enlighten with our special guest who will be joining us later, First Lady Linyard Robinson with her very special segment. But before we do that, as always, we start with that spoken word that I mentioned. So let's make our way now to Southern Baptist Church this morning and await the uh, message of Bishop Dante Hickman and the uh, Southern family here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr. By the time of our text, my dear brothers and sisters, King Solomon had completed the building of the second temple after the first temple had been destroyed when the people of God had been taken into captivity and exiled and their homeland had been destroyed. And after the completion of this second temple, there was a dedication event that lasted for days. They had, as it were, in our vernacular, a revival. And in this revival of worship, they dedicated their sacrifices to God. Sacrifices were offered for his mercy to the people of God. God had brought them back from something they never thought would have happened to them and something they thought they would have never been able to overcome. And in this instance, the Bible says they built a temple to worship him. And when they came into that temple, they gave sacrificially to show how grateful they were for what God had done for them. And I need to park here parenthetically to say that when God has been forgiving of you and when God has always given to you even what you do not deserve you ought to demonstrate your appreciation by giving back to God we ought to give God not only the praise from our lip but we ought to give him the fruit of our lives the fruit of our sacrifice because Jesus said where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. For the mercy of God, they showed their appreciation to God by being in service all week long and by sacrificing their offerings to him. On this occasion, they gave significantly and sacrificially to God. And God was pleased with his people. Nevertheless, beyond the dedication of the building and beyond their sacrificial giving, Solomon was praying. He was praying for the presence and the preservation of God in the temple and that God, beyond this dedicatory event, beyond this beautiful building, beyond this revival experience, beyond the offerings that we'll offer before you from this temple, he prayed that God would hear the prayers of his people from the temple they had built. This was not just some temple that they would come in and admire it for its physical beauty. For Solomon, the building meant nothing if God was not going to dwell in it and demonstrate his power through it. And I think that that point needs to be hammered, hammered home, even as many churches are returning to in-person worship and even as we are preparing for in-person worship. I think that it's important that we don't emphasize and stress the, the gratitude for just being in a building. I, I think it's important that after over a year and a half of being the church, 
that we don't limit God to the four walls or to the structure and the institutions that we have as buildings for the church. No, my dear brothers and sisters, it's wonderful to have a place where we can come and worship, but it's even better when God dwells in the place and that the prayers that we pray from the place are actually heard and answered by God. Many of us, quite frankly, need to know and, and many of us have discovered throughout this year that the power is not the building. The power of God is not the singing. The power is not the preaching. The power is not the social media, it's not the personalities, it's not the worship production, but it's actually the prayers behind the scenes. Did you hear what I said? While we love all of what technology affords us, we love to hear great preaching, we love to, to hear beautiful and, and powerful singing, we love to be in environments and atmospheres that are beautiful and that ascribe the greatness and the glory of God, but don't get it twisted, the power behind all of it is in the prayers that are behind the scenes. It's the prayer meetings, individually and collectively. It's, it's the prayer meetings, whether we're in the chapel or on a conference call line, that really fuel the power of God to and through the church. It's prayer, my dear brothers and sisters. It's our constant communication and affiliation and association with the God of our creation and our salvation. Never negate nor neglect the power of prayer. I don't care how big or how small the building. I don't care how loud or how soft the music might be. I don't care how the preacher may holler or how they may talk. If there is no prayer, there is is no power from God. Subsequently, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night for the second time in this text that I've just read to you. And he said to him these words, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Get that? Solomon had worked to build the temple, and now he has dedicated it, and they're giving to God, and everything looks wonderful, but God says, I've heard your prayer. He says, I know what you really expect out of the house of God, and I want you to know that I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. God let Solomon know that he was pleased and that he heard his prayers. And get this, he made a commitment to receive offerings and hear and answer prayers that were given and prayed from the temple. That, that, that's it, that's it. God said, this is my house. And as you give to me, I receive through this house. He said, this is my dwelling place. This is my temple. And I have decided to choose my church as the place or as the conduit to receive offerings, but also to hear and to answer your prayers. What a blessing. It is to know that what we give and what we pray is not in vain in the Lord. You're not giving to, to a preacher. You're not giving to a mere organization. 
You're not praying to the ceiling or to one another. You're not praying for the effect and the impact that it has on people. No, every time we sow in the physical and in the spiritual, God receives and God responds. But God also gave to Solomon another revelation and a rescue plan. Yes, God, God, God told him, gave him the assurance, gave him the affirmation, I heard your prayer. And this is what I've decided to do. I've chosen this house that you're dedicating to me to be the place I'm going to receive offering here and answer your prayer. Now, now I need to back up and just tell you something that God had just dropped in my spirit that Solomon wasn't sure that God was going to be pleased, receive the offering, and hear his prayer. He made the sacrifice to build the temple, and he prayed along the way. And as he sacrificed and gave to God by faith, God turned around and said, I'm pleased. I see your heart. I see where you're trying to go, I see your authenticity. And now I'm going to bless you in all that you have accomplished. But that ain't all I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a revelation of things to come. And I'm going to give you a rescue plan of how to deal with it. You ready? He says, here's the revelation. The revelation that he gave was of divine judgment. The rescue plan is divine mercy. Write that down. Text it if you, if, if you please. That, 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 that the revelation God give, gave is divine judgment. But the rescue plan is divine mercy. God, God, God said, here's the judgment. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Now, 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 God just told him, I'm going to hear your prayers. He just told him, I've chosen this place to receive sacrifices from, and hear and answer all of your prayers, and not a period, but a comma, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts uh, to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. First of all, first of all, God was foretelling his divine judgment because of his foreknowledge of our immorality and our idolatry. God says, today is a good day, and everybody is praising me well, but I've seen this people praise me before. I've seen these people, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, they were happy for a season, but then when they got into the wilderness, they started complaining and bickering and murmuring against Moses, and that's why they had to spend more than 38 years, 40 years in the wilderness, going in circles and in cycles. I've seen this before. I brought them out of the wilderness, took them into the promised land. They got in there and ate the milk and the honey and all of the fat of the land and then they started worshiping and serving idol gods and I had to cause them to come back into captivity God knows that you and I have the proclivity and the propensity to do good for a while and then after a while we go back to business as usual after a while we forget his grace we forget his mercy we forget his commandments. We forget his priorities and his principles. We forget the word. We forget about sacrificially giving. We forget even about praying. And here it is. God says, when you do that, I'm going to shut up the heaven and there'll be no rain. I, I'm going to command the locusts to devour the land. I'm going to send pestilence among the people. Hey, did you hear that? The devil didn't do it. Can you imagine that what is happening in our world today is beyond the power of the devil? Can you imagine 
the, that what's happening in our world today is beyond the power of the government. Have you ever imagined that maybe God has, has turned on judgment? Maybe God is causing hell in the land because of our immorality and because of our idolatry, because of our wicked ways. And that's the mercy of God to even let you know that this is going to happen before it happens. And thank God that in his mercy, he not only gives us a revelation of his divine judgment, but he also gives us a revelation of his divine mercy and a rescue plan. Yes, God says there's, there's a rescue plan. He, he provided a rescue plan. He said, y'all going to mess up and y'all going to cause me to do some stuff that I don't want to do. I've already promised that I'm not going to cause the world to drown by water and by flood. It's going to be fire the next time. And they already started in the West Coast. We're calling it uh, something to do with the environment. But maybe it's something to do with spiritual wickedness. He says, and after all of this, I provided a rescue plan. He says, if my people, watch this, when I shut up the heavens... When I cause the locusts to eat up the land. When I send the pestilence in the land. If, yes, yes, not when. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear all the way from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Listen to me, child of God, children of God. God was and is telling us that the sanity, the stability, and the sustainability of the world is based upon our faithfulness as believers. See, see, here's the problem. Everybody's trying to be sanitized, but ain't nobody trying to be sanctified. Oh, yes, everybody want to wash their hands, but, but nobody want, wants, wants to be sanctified on the inside of your heart. Yeah, everybody's got to wear, got to wear a mask, but we won't take down uh, the inauthentic mask of our character and who we are on the inside. God says, I've created my church to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. To be, to be a candlelight in a bushel that, that can never be put out. To, to be a city that's set up on a hill. He says, but, but in order for this world to not just merely be sanitized, but to be sanctified, is going to be based upon the faithfulness of the believers, watch this, to humble themselves. He's not talking merely to the world. The world is on its way to hell. If they don't receive Jesus Christ, the faith thereof, and the grace of God, the, the world is doing exactly what the world is supposed to do. But the problem is, too many believers have become high-minded, have become haughty, have become beside themselves, have gotten to the point where we're arrogant and overly confident and not trusting the power of God but trusting in ourselves, trusting in our own intelligentsia, trusting in our own material wealth. He says, you got to get to the point where you humble yourself, where you realize I'm nothing apart from the power of God. I live, I move, I have my being by the power of God. If it were not for God, I would not be where I am today. And if the Lord had not been on my side, I, I would be dead. I would be strung out. I would be cuckoo. I would be crazy. I would not have it as good as I got it. He said, church, humble. Humble yourself. Don't you get caught up 
because you got a big building, you call yourself a mega church and a mega preacher and a mega pastor and a mega revivalist. Don't you think that it's all about you? Jesus said, I was mega before you even called it mega. It was multitudes of disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Don't get beside yourself because you've gotten a little money and now you can't say like Peter and John silver and gold I don't have none now you got to share some of what you have he says it's up to us faithfulness of believers to humble ourselves watch this and to pray and to seek the face of God I'm glad he said that he said, pray. And many of us are saying, yeah, yes, yes, I'm praying. Re Reverend, I pray. I pray every day. Oh, God, I pray. I say my prayers morning, noon, and night. Yes, Reverend, I'm on the prayer call. Yeah, I come to prayer meeting. I've learned. I've learned how to pray. But, but have you learned how to seek the face of God? It is interesting because in our prayers and even in our preaching and in our praising, we are not seeking the face of God as much as we are seeking the hand of God. We're always looking for God to give us something, for God to do something, for God to make a way, and for God to open a door. We're always looking for the hand of God, but never the heart of God through the face of God, to hear the voice of God, to know the mind and the will and the purposes of God for our lives. I, I mean, now we got pray. We can't praise. You, you, if you praise them, you're going to get something. The, it, when praises go up, then, then blessings go down. What, what, what about praises just going up? for blessings that have already been around and not just for blessings that are coming down. Why do we preach these sermons and make these empty and vain promises to people that if you make noise, God is going to make you a millionaire? And if you make noise, that God is going to give you seven businesses. And if you jump for joy, that God is going to turn this situation around. Our praise and our preaching and our prayers should not be predicated on what we're going to get but what we are going to give and if you're not careful God will cause this pandemic to last a little while longer because God is seeing that some of us still have not turned around to seek his face some of us are just going back to where we started off and now we got a Delta variant he says, he says, turn from their wicked ways. Hear me, saints. I know, I know some of y'all tuning me out. You want to hear this kind of message. But somewhere along the way, we've lost the sense of holiness or hell. We've learned, even as Christians, how to straddle the fence. We, we've learned that we can be anything we want, do anything we want to anybody we want, act any kind of way we want, say whatever we want to say out of our mouths, and God is going to bless us anyhow. God is gracious, and God is merciful, and God loves me unconditionally, but that is the cheapest form of grace that you can find. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No, I've got to have a consciousness. I don't want to be turned over to a reprobate mind. I don't want to live my life apart from God in wickedness and not even feel that my ways are wrong and that I don't have to apologize and that I don't have to ask God for forgiveness and I don't have to repent and change and turn around. God says you don't have to stay that same old way and I don't care who's comfortable with you that way. Make them uncomfortable and change your wicked ways Hol holiness holiness is not perfection but it is my intentional striving to be pleasing his sight of God every day that I'm awake every decision that I make every step that I take must be bathed in prayer as I trust in the Lord with all of my heart and lean not to my own understanding but in all my ways I'm acknowledging him and 
and I'm allowing him to direct every path of my life. God is calling us. This is why I'm preaching this sermon because God is calling us in this season to correct our misplaced priorities. We've got to get our focus back. We got to get back to being the real church. We got to get back to an authentic praise. We got to get back to a real prayer life where we not only ask God, but we wait to hear the answers from God and we act according to what we've heard from God. We got to get back to preaching the real word of God and not these uh, pithy preachments uh, and, and these flowery words uh, and, and not these personalities and stories and illustrations. We got to get back to gospel preaching, feeding people the word of God and what God is saying to his church and to his people in this last day and in this season. And here's the good news, my dear brothers and sisters. If we're willing to follow the prescription of the word of God and even in this verse of scripture that God says he's given us the power to turn this thing around. I marvel, I tell you, I marvel at our world today with all of the money, with all of the material wealth, with all of the militaristic power, even with Democrats controlling the House and the Senate. I marvel that they still don't have the answer to all of the world's problems. I marvel that with all the money uh, that our city is still plagued with violence uh, and people are killing one another every day. Even cops killing their own children every day. Uh, we're living in a world that is decaying uh, and that is becoming regressively worse uh, and nobody can stop it with all the money in the country and yet we still have children and families Families that are living in abject poverty. We can't fix up our schools. We can't get everybody health care. We've got problems uh, everywhere and we can't run from them. They can have the Olympics, but they found out COVID will find you in Tokyo. And now they can't even have a crowd in the stadium to watch them. Why? Because everybody thinks that government can solve it. And everybody thinks that scientists and, and doctors can solve it. And everybody seems to think uh, that the, the rich and the wealthy and the politicians can solve it. But I came to tell you uh, that the only people that can solve uh, the problems of this world uh, are the people of God uh, who turned uh, their ways around uh, so that they can turn around uh, what's happening in this world uh, even if it's just for a season and God sent me back here to tell you that if we correct our misplaced priorities uh, then he will hear us. Uh, yes type that down. I, I need you to write that down. God will hear us. Yes God says uh, in order for me to hear you. Uh, you've got to be able to get your heart in a place uh, where you are pleasing in my sight. Uh, you can't just do whatever you want to do and think you're going to call on God and God is going to hear everything that you're saying. No, you got to be willing to hear God and to heed God's word. And God says, I'll hear you even from heaven. And I don't know about you, but that's the best blessing that I could ever receive from God when nobody else hears me when nobody else wants to talk to me when nobody else understands me when nobody else can identify my issue when I am crazy within myself I can have a little talk with Jesus yes I can tell him all about my struggles he will hear my faintest cry and he will answer by and by do I have a witness here I want God to hear me and when God hears me me. God can answer me and God can affirm me and God can tell me the way in which God wants me to go. I want to know that God hears me even if God does not turn it around. It is something about knowing that God has heard your prayer that will turn you around. I wish I had a witness that can testify that sometimes prayer does not change the thing but sometimes prayer changes the 
way I see the thing. Prayer changes my behavior uh, uh, to the thing. Uh, and prayer changes my activities uh, and my purpose around the thing. I, I just want to thank God that when I pray my prayers uh, that God You've hears You've been watching the me. television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. Good morning, Baltimore. Good morning, surrounding areas. Good morning, the people of God. We welcome you to the women's segment of Grace and Glory. I am Pastor Lady Lenyard Robinson of Dream Life Worship Center, and I'm so glad that you decided to start your Sunday morning with me. Well, I have a very special guest and a very, very important subject this morning. We're gonna talk about young people navigating through this new world, young Christian believers navigating through this current culture and this cult current world. And I have a very special guest, my very own daughter, my firstborn, Miss Chloe Berry, who's been with us before, and I'm so excited to bring her back on uh, to Grace and Glory. Good morning, Miss Chloe. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. You've joined us uh, before here on Grace and Glory, sharing with us your missions efforts and your passion for missions and outreach. And you are here with us again, so I thank you for taking time out of your busy a uh, college bound schedule to share with us on grace and glory this morning my pleasure well listen how tell our viewers how old you are i am 18 years old 18 and on your way what are your plans for the future well i'm going to be studying political science in undergrad and then i have plans to go to law school after mm -hmm. i'm not sure what um, type of law i want to do but i know that i will make an influence on yeah the community. So that's my plan. So you're going to 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 college for a year and you have pre law on your horizon. And mm -hmm. and I know that pre law is is a passion of yours. Tell the audience uh, about your passions. Why pre law? Uh, what kind of things are we know that you're engaged in missions, but what other things are you passionate about? And how do you think law is going to play out with that in, in your future? So some of my other passions include sociopolitics and how politics affect the Christian and black communities, minority communities as well. Uh -huh. So um, like watching different caucus meetings on C-SPAN and just being really aware of what's happening within the national community and also the local community as well. Wow. Now, listen, caucus meetings, listen, viewers, I don't know. She did not get that from me. So this is truly <laughs> this is truly a God given passion that you have that you that you are really, really pursuing. And I'm so proud of that. T tell us about your as a young person, a believer who have been who has been raised to to honor God and to honor the Lord as your savior. How does your advocacy and your outreach, how does how do you engage in public policy and advocacy yet uh, standing firm in your convictions? Well, I think the easiest way to do that is just know who you are in Christ mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit will give you firmness and conviction and it will strengthen you in whatever um, environment you're in. Mm -hmm. so, no matter what people are doing around me, I know who I am and I know who I serve and I don't let other people sway me. That's powerful, Chloe. So, you know, people, young adults, people who are entering into a adulthood, there's a way that you are you are you saying that there's a way that you can engage in your passions? And I know for myself, you have. Uh, been a part of much diversity training and, and, and um, that that embraces all people. And so you're saying that you can still do that in this world and still strength, stand strong in your convictions. What do you think the greatest need in your generation today is? I would say the greatest need in my generation is for people to find uh, what their passion is and uh -huh. stick to it. Because I think when there's so many different things, it becomes hard for people to 
really navigate who they are in the world and then be able to make a change and a difference. Yeah. So, so, so to, to really discover your purpose, when you say your passion, does that, you mean your per, a purpose, purpose, person's God given purpose? Yes. So, so as you discovered your purpose and your your purpose includes, tell us all the things you, when you talk about advocacy, who are you advocating for? Um, that's a difficult question. I think I would say, um, I would say Christians, mm -hmm. I would say women, I would mm -hmm. say, um, immigrants, black, oh, wow. uh, people with disabilities, especially that's something that I'm very passionate about as well, that I don't talk about as much, but, um, mm -hmm. Just anyone who feels uh, disconnected or misplaced. Oh, that's powerful. The underserved. And that's really the heart of Christ, isn't it, Chloe? That that we would speak for those who have no voice, that we would stand for those who are unable to stand on their own. And so do you think that there's an age limit on when you can begin uh, advocating for those who have no voice? Do you think that, that one can be too young or too old? No, I don't think there's necessarily an age limit, but I do think age does have a factor in it. Mm -hmm. um, because if you are outreaching to someone who's around the same age as you, mm -hmm. a different level of respect than they would have for someone who's older. And mm -hmm. then older people have more wisdom, so they might be able to give more input. So all different ages are valuable. And I think it's important for the different generations to work together in these efforts. Oh, that's wonderful. You're right. There is wisdom. That's, actually, the scripture says that those who are, are more seasoned, I should say, they, they, they give us wisdom and uh, you have the strength, you have the energy and then the older generation has the wisdom. So, so Chloe, tell us um, as a young lady entering into adulthood, what uh, sorts of, what is your greatest your greatest resource as you enter into the world. I want you to share, first of all, your greatest resource. And then I want you to share some resources with our, our young audience, how they can get involved with the world and make an impact and make a change. So I do enjoy reading a lot of books about anti-racism and inclusivity, but mm -hmm. one a resource that I follow on Instagram is called And Campaign. And they talk about uh, the interactions between Christian communities and sociopolitics, mm -hmm. how you can be compassionate and convicted at the same time. And they have a lot of different um, links and books and tweets that you can read that will give you a lot of information on this. Again, And Campaign. And okay. Campaign, is that A-N-D Campaign? Mm -hmm on Instagram. That's powerful. I love the phrase. You can be compassionate and con and stand in conviction at the same time. I think that's the perfect way to end our time together is to share with our audience that you can be compassionate and stand in your conviction at the same time. And that's our prayer for you as you enter into your college and to your in your your continued efforts and mission and out, outreach that's my prayer for you as your mother um and it is our prayer for you in your generation chloe that you go and impact with compassion and with conviction and we are with you thank you so much for taking time out of your busy um college bound schedule to share with us on grace and glory this morning we're going to check back in with you chloe maybe in the next six months to 12 months to make sure that uh, you're doing okay and to see what else you have to say to us. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks All for right. having me. All right. We'll see you soon. Well, there you have it. There's Miss Chloe Berry, very special, powerful young lady who's making her moves in the world in compassion and conviction. So I want you to remember that as you prepare to worship in person or online today to serve your community, your world, your family, your spirit in compassion and conviction. And stay tuned for our next spoken word by Dr. Jermaine Johnson and the Word of Life Christian Church. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Good morning and welcome to the Catalyst for Life televised broadcast brought to you by the Word of Life Christian Community Church, where the pastors are 
Dr. Jermaine Johnson, and co-pastor Elder Michelle Johnson, where we believe that it all begins with the word, for the word is life. Somebody thank God. The time that's ours, in this first installment of this series, The Secret is Out, I want to preach from the thought, a whole the line. virtually or in person, just tell them, hold the line. Tell them, tell them, stand firm and hold the line. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hold the line. For a working definition, hold the line uh, means to firmly hold one's position. To firmly hold one's position. That's good teaching, Kim. Hallelujah. All right. Hold the line. To firmly hold one's position. Um, Zoe's in her second year of playing softball. Um, her team is currently in uh, first place. And, um, over the last over the last two days, they had the opportunity to play uh, three games. Three games in two days. Yesterday, uh, Sherry, they won a, a double hitter. For those of you who don't know about softball or baseball, that's two games in one day. They, they played two games in the same day, and Friday night, they played a very close game, in which Zoe got a game-changing hit. My, my, my baby girl got a game-changing she got a She got a game-changing hit. That hit gave her the opportunity to go to first base. And, and, and Micah, uh, she then went to second base, and eventually, uh, she was on third base. And, uh, for those of you who don't know softball or baseball, Natanya, third base is one step closer to home. One step, one step closer to, to going home. The score is five to five. Zoe's um, the winning run if she can get there. If she can get there. It's one step closer to going home. Zoe's uh, she's there, and her father happens to be the third base coach. Father happens to be the third base coach, and father tells Zoe that if the ball is hit to the pitcher, ball is hit to the pitcher, I, I just need you to go halfway, and I need you to hold the line. I need you. If the ball is hit to the pitcher. It's easy for you to get out. That's not the time to go. I know it looks enticing, but I just need you to, to hold the line. Don't be tempted to go before the Father's voice. I just need you to hold, hold, hold the line. So I told her before it happened, and then the next pitch, Margot, it happened. The hitter hit it to the pitcher, and, and Zoe, this time, this time, somebody say this time, she followed the instructions of her father. She, she listened. She waited. She went as far as she could go, and she held the line. She was able to hold the line in the midst of all the outside noise, in the midst of the people in the crowds, in the midst of the external noise, in the midst of the pressure uh, of a 10-year-old playing in a game on Friday night in which the score is tied. It's in the last inning, but yet she was able to hold the line, Trina. She was able to to stay in position, which gave her team an opportunity to win the game based on the performance of the next batter. And in this Pentecost season, when the words of the post-resurrected Jesus hovering over all of us, all we need is an opportunity to hold the line that we too may stay in position to experience our winning seasons our opportunity to experience the manifestation of the promises of God. Promises that are illuminated in our text as the post resurrected Jesus has been consistent in his person and work. Y'all, he's been teaching for three and a half years that the process of something greater is coming. It's in John chapter 14, verse 12, where Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do because I go to the Father. And as we arrive on the scene of our text, Elder Elect Vanessa, the process of the plan of the promise, y'all, let's in full throttle. As the post-resurrected Jesus provides some necessary instructions. Somebody say necessary instructions for the disciples to receive their next. It's in Luke chapter 24 as Jesus has appearing to the disciples at the initial stages of this 40-day journey. He appears to them and he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. 
but tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The Bible says he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and he carried up into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continuously in the temple praising and blessing God. Y'all, this here in Luke chapter 24 is the beginning of this 40-day process, this 40-day journey in which they are waiting. They are waiting for their next set of instructions. They are simply living off of a word. While they are in process, they are simply instructed to hold the line. Jesus, y'all, at this time during these 40 days, uh, he's making pop-up appearances, pop-up with instructions, pop-up with the word to remind you that the promise is coming. And over the last five months, over the last three years of this pandemic, over the last decade of your life, aren't you glad that you may not have the promise in your hand yet, but week after week, day after day, God has been making pop-up appearances uh, to remind you uh, that the promises of God for your life uh, are still yes and amen. Do I have a witness? There have been times uh, that you felt as if God has forgotten about you, uh, that you were never seen the day of light. Uh, darkness seemed like it was a permanent reality but I'm thanking God that he would do pop-up appearances uh, through his word, uh, through people, uh, through the sermons, through television shows. Uh, I'm grateful today that God has not forgotten about you. Can you type in God has not forgotten about you? Can you encourage your neighbor that God has not forgotten about you? And I want to encourage you, that's what we do Sunday after Sunday, Tuesday after Tuesday, day after day. We encourage you, we remind you through God's word that God's promise is coming. Just hold the line. The first thing we learned from the text of Minister Keisha Lemon, uh, we have to hold the line to the Father's instructions. Somebody said, I got to hold the line to the Father's instructions. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 where he tells them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And not only are you, are you encouraged to hold the line uh, to the Father instructions as they are literally living in the midst of external noise. People are threatening their life. Uh, the one who they've been with for three years, uh, three and a half years, uh, learning and receiving all type of instructions uh, ha has now changed in his form, has now allowed them to enter a new season. The things uh, that they used to do, the ways that they used to receive uh, is no longer their faithfulness uh, and their ability uh, to hang in there with Jesus uh, has qualified them for the next level. Uh, and I want to stop there before I get too far in the message. You've been faithful in your journey. I know it doesn't seem like that and it doesn't seem you're not receiving or feeling the same way you did in prior seasons but I want to encourage you that doesn't mean that God is not with you. That means you've entered another dimension in him. Somebody thank God for the elevation that has come upon your life. Oh somebody ought to honor God for that. That God trusts you for the next level. He trusts you for a community. He trusts you that, that your pastor can be elevated to bishop. He, he trusts you that as a church and as a people, we can make a difference. Somebody ought to be encouraged that God trusts you for the greater that he has promised you. Look at your neighbor and say, God trusts you. Not only are you encouraged to hold the line to the father's instructions, but the text also teaches us uh, you ought to hold the line to the father's authority. Verse 7, he says to them, it is not for you to know. Look at somebody and say, it's not for you to know. I know you're grown, but it's not for you to know. He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates, Kimberly, 
the Father has set by his own authority. I, I could stop there. Uh, he's telling you it's not for you to know. The things that God has for you, I know you are uh, you're, you're organized. I, I get that you are a planner. But he says in this particular case, uh, I need you to elevate your faith. It's not for you to know that when the manifestation is coming, all you need to know that it is coming. Somebody say, it is coming. I don't know when, but somebody say, it is coming. Just after it hit me one time. You don't need to know when, but you just need to know it is coming. I'm trying to help you right there. You don't need to know when it's coming. You don't need to know when. Just know that it's coming. Somebody say it's coming. Can you find five people and just tell them it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Come on, tell them it's coming, it's coming. Come on, no, go find them and tell them it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Tell somebody else it's coming, it's coming. Come on, you don't need to know when. Just know that it's it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. He says, you're going to receive power. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Y'all, this statement demonstrates for you and I that, that the sovereignty of God is at working in our lives. That the God of our salvation, Kevin, has all things under his control. Somebody say all things are under his control. Uh, with the murder rate in Baltimore, I, I know it seems dismal, but all things are, are under his control. I know gas prices are ridiculous, uh, but all things are under his control. I know you know, food market prices, uh, we are living in inflation, but some might declare all things are under his control. I know sickness and health challenges are facing us, but can I encourage you that all things are, are under his control? He says, I want was young and now I'm old, but I never saw the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. Somebody thank God that he's a healer. There is a bomb in Gilead. I believe that all things are under his control. Can you encourage yourself and your spirit that with all that's happening around me, in me, through me, I'm encouraging myself right now that all things are under his control. I'm good, Anthony. Thank you. He, he, he says, he says, he says, it's not for you to know the times of days that the Father has set in his authority. Just know that at the right time, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's not for you to know. Just know that at the right time, you're going to receive exactly what you need. And as a result, it's not just for you, but you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem. You're going to be my witness in Judea. You're going to be my witness in Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. Look at you. You messed around and made it to the northwest area of Park Heights. He didn't messed around and, and promise you that you're going to be his witness. Somebody say you're going to be his witness. And just know, based on the authority of the father, you have the ability to trust and believe in him. You're going to experience a the greater that is promised to you. The thing that makes this powerful is that this movement, uh, that this manifestation of the promise, y'all, is going to happen. Somebody say, it's going to happen. Huh? The question is, are you going to experience it? Because it's sure enough uh, going to happen. God's going to do uh, what he says he's going to do. He's going to bless this church, uh, whether I'm here or you here or not. Somebody say, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, oh, somebody say, encourage yourself. Say, it's going to happen. The, the blessings of God are yes and amen. It's going to happen. Come on. Somebody declare, it's going to happen. It's not a matter. Come on. It's not a question uh, if you do this, if you don't do this. Uh, I'm trying to tell you what God has for you. It's going to happen. What he has as for this branch of Zion, somebody to cry, it's going to happen. The question is, are we going to experience? Will you disqualify yourself? Will you been told to hold a line? Will you get out of line? Will you get weary by the pandemic? Will you let the spirit of offense take you out? Will you leave your place of promise prematurely based on your feelings over facts? Will you forego the authority of the Father for the affirmations and the accusations of a friend or foe. Because I want you to know you got a seat at the table. Look at your neighbor and say, you got a seat at the table. <laughs> there, there, there's space for you in the room. I, I want to tell you that, that you got a seat at the table and, and there's space for you 
in the room. I, I, I don't think you understand it. That, that, that as long as I'm in the room, good God Almighty, I might not be at the head of the table. I may not be the best friend. I may not be man's likely choice, but I thank God that, that I got a seat at the table and there's space for me in the room. All I need is an opportunity. Somebody declare, all I need is an opportunity. You give me a little hope, that's enough. You ain't got to invite me to dinner. You ain't got to invite me to lunch. But I thank God that there is room for me. There is space for me in the room. And I thank God that even in the midst of my faults, even in the midst of my imperfections, even in the midst of my sinful state, God declares to you and I, there's a seat reserved for you at the table. I'm only talking to folk who don't have perfect lives. Folk who done messed up. Folk who done said some stuff. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Folk who got a pass. I'm trying to let you know that if you can hold the line and not get out of it, there's a seat for you. There's space for you. Somebody ought to thank God that God isn't done with me yet. There's a future planned for you. Guess what? There's a reward awaiting you. Your tears your prayers, your ability to hold the line of God's promises for his church, for his community, for your life has qualified you that you are moments, you are days away from seeing God's promises in your life come to pass. Somebody declare, I got to hold the line, hold the line of my father instructions hold the line of my father's authority why because his name it got some weight to it come on look at your neighbor and say God's name has some weight to it come on look at somebody and say God's name it got some weight to it it's not shallow it's been through some stuff the psalmist declares that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness somebody declare God's name it has some weight to it. The psalmist says you can lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Well, who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty and battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the one with some weight, the king of glory, shall come in. They ask the question, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Somebody say God's name. It carries some weight. That's why they call him Jehovah Rapha, because he's a healer. His name carries some weight. They call him Jehovah Shalom. He's our peace, because his name it carries some weight. Uh, they call him Jehovah Nisa, uh, which declares uh, the Lord is our banner. Uh, the Lord is our victory uh, because his name, uh, it carries some weight. Uh, his name uh, is a strong tower. Uh, the righteous run into it uh, and they find safe uh, because the name of our God, uh, it carries some weight. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the name of Jesus uh, carries some weight. Uh, Paul declares that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord because the name of our God it carries some weight I can walk through fire with gasoline on and not be burned because the name of God it carries some weight somebody can live because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all my fears are gone because I know he holds the future life is worth living just because he lives because I serve the God who name carries some weight can you give him praise that he can make your burdens light he can make your yoke easy he can renew your mind when you weak you can be strong when you broke you can find a wealth. Somebody declare her. His name. His name. His name. It carries some weight. Let the redeemed of the Lord shout yes. Shout yes. 
shout hallelujah. I got to hold the line. Look at your name and say hold the line. Welcome back. Thank you, First Lady Lynn Yar, for a wonderful segment. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Before we go, just want to remind you the Heaven 600 Summer Cruise Series has resumed. Uh, we're set to set sail uh, on July the 23rd. Uh, to get more information, you can go to cityexperience.com. Special guests, the group Fire and Otis Kemp. And I'll be celebrating my birthday. So please, by all means, consider this an invitation to join us, okay? And speaking of joining us, join us again next week at the same time uh, as we continue to walk in his grace and live in his glory. We we'll look forward to seeing you right here on Grace and Glory.